car bomb attack on the Kobar Towers on the oil-rich Gulf Coast of Saudi Arabia has not been solved to this day. In June 1996, it left 19 Americans dead in the housing complex of the United States Air Force Base in Dharan. According to rumors, Al-Qaeda was behind the attack. The Saudi government, however, obstructed the investigation as they didn't want to admit the existence of Al-Qaeda networks in their country. The attack on the World Trade Center in New York City on September the 11th, 2001, seriously embarrassed the Saudi government. The Saudi authorities attempted to deny the involvement of 15 Saudi citizens. In May 2003, a new phase in the conflict with Al-Qaeda began. In Riyadh, nine terrorists managed to enter three compounds, mainly inhabited by foreigners, and detonated car bombs. 26 people died, among them Americans and Saudis. Saudi Crown Prince Abdullah, the present king, announced a harsh crackdown on terror during his visit to the victims of the bombings and warned Wahhabi clerics against showing undue sympathy with the murderers. The Minister of Foreign Affairs, Prince Faisal, Abdullah's half-brother, was equally adamant. It should make us not hesitate to take whatever measures that are needed to oppose these people who not only hate only killing and for no purpose whatsoever. Police began an active crackdown on Al-Qaeda cells, killing six of its members during a clash in Riyadh in June 2006. The Saudi media now also began reporting the terrorist attacks. There could no longer be any doubt that the royal house and government of Saudi Arabia were also in danger. In Riyadh, all public buildings and major hotels were placed under protection by motorized police checkpoints and concrete roadblocks. Foreigners became potential sniper targets. But officially, this topic still remains a taboo subject. You know, in this part of the world, you are a very good guy if you keep silent and shut up. President Bush wanted to bring democracy to the Arab world. This was not a popular reason to go to war in the region. As his soldiers marched into Iraq in April 2003, they were not allowed to operate from their military bases, which were still in existence in Saudi Arabia. The Americans set up their main headquarters in Qatar. The real reasons for the war are unclear. Allegedly, the Americans wanted to destroy Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction, but as such weapons were never found, it was presumed that they were primarily interested in the Iraqi oil. This presumption is probably only part of the truth. After 9-11, the real reason was probably their paranoid fear of a threat to their security from the Mideast. In the beginning, the residents of Baghdad celebrated the expulsion of Saddam Hussein as liberation and toppled his statue from its pedestal. Like the Americans, they were blissfully unaware that this victory would mean the disintegration of their state and the destabilization of the Middle East. Saddam Hussein had already underestimated American determination once before. So he never dreamed that Bush Sr. would react the way he did when he took and gobbled up uh, Kuwait. Now, when Bush Sr. took the position, ejected Saddam out of Kuwait, that was a time when Iraqi institutions, the Iraqi country, was had that job been finished, had what was done in postponed to 2003 been done in 1991, we would not have had the complete collapse of infrastructure, of society, of ministries, of government institutions that we saw in 2003. In, and what happened in between 1991 and 2003? One word, sanctions. Sanctions truly undermined the social fabric of Iraq. Mm -hmm.
The sanctions affected the wrong people, the children who suffered from shortages of food and medical supplies. Even though Saddam Hussein found a few nations who would do business with him and also illegally bought Iraqi oil from him, he was not really interested in the plight of the children. He used their distress as a propaganda tool in order to put blame on the West for Iraq's difficult economic situation. For humanitarian reasons, the United Nations introduced the Oil for Food program to allow the sale of certain quantities of Iraqi oil in exchange for goods such as food and medicine. To make sure that these goods were distributed to the right people, international aid organizations became involved. Saddam Hussein pocketed huge sums of money from vast black market deals in oil. High-ranking UN officials were also involved in the abuse of the Oil for Food program. Between 1968-2003, we had something that was exceptional, even by Middle East and other the standards of the Middle East, which are very low standards of, uh, of, of, of in general. We had it's not only a nasty, brutish, uh, repressive, uh, autocratic, etc. regime. It's it's uh, it it was a regime made possible by extraordinary levels of wealth, which of course only became real in 1973 with the quadrupling of the oil price uh, following the October War and that continued to go up. It is upon that that the totalitarian state in Iraq was built. Upon that wealth, enormous wealth. Not much is left of the country's former wealth. One of the two large oil regions in Iraq is located in Kirkuk, the ethnically mixed and disputed border area between the Arab and the Kurdish part of Iraq. With the help of the Peshmerga, the well-armed Kurdish militia, the Kurds can maintain relative security here. They focus on the terrorists who repeatedly launch assaults on oil plants and oil pipelines. On the way to the oil fields, the Peshmerga collect reinforcements from their headquarters in the city center of Kirkuk. Roadblocks and control posts monitor the traffic. Endangered persons, like our crew, are closely guarded and driven at high speed through the unsafe zones around the oil fields. The high speed is supposed to prevent suicide bombers from throwing themselves between the racing jeeps. The team has to film from the moving car, as the Peshmerga cannot even guarantee their safety within the cordoned off area. The oil fields are in a bad condition. Gas is burnt unused as there are no pumps to absorb it. Most of the technology dates from the 1920s and 30s. There's no money to modernize the offices and pumping facilities. Even though the oil is flowing again, the production is still nowhere near the level it reached in 1990 before the Second Gulf War. After hostilities ceased, it was reduced to half. Iraq, which was once the second largest oil exporting country in the world, now no longer plays a significant role on the oil market. The chief engineer explains why the Americans' hopes of restarting oil production quickly were dashed. The investment on oil field was something in Kurdistan, was something around one billion dollar, eight hundred something. We have, you know, spent more than half of that money to the security issues and half of it to the, you know, it is no sense to, keep, to rehabilitate a, a plant then attacked by insurgencies or the, for the next day. It's no sense to keep it like that. Either themselves, American people, they have helped us on engineering assessment for the plants, I mean, for the facilities. They have rehabilitated that, those facilities, but they have we have lost half of that investment to the security issue. Exactly, more than half, to be very frankly with you. Even within the cordoned off compound, the executive employees can only move around with heavily armed security guards. Kidnappings of employees are commonplace. The attacks on the oil fields are sometimes carried out by their own employees.
The damage left by Saddam Hussein's oil politics after the end of the Second Gulf War has also not yet been repaired. He encouraged increased oil production more than he was able to sell due to the sanctions, even during the Oil for Food program. The surplus oil had to be pumped back into the wells. Now at the current situation is 350, only 350,000 barrel per day. All the fields has been ignored and ruined by either uh, by politician first, then by the technical people. Many of our field has been ruined by via the reverse injection of oil into the wells. During the resolution of uh, United Nations for oil, food for oil, during that period, we were obliged to do that because, the limitation, because of the limitation of the production. But every day we are here losing a couple of thousands, every day. The Kurds consider Kirkuk their city, but thousands of Kurds still dwell outside the gates of their old homeland in a former soccer stadium, now used as a refugee camp. They had to make way for Arabs, who were forcibly resettled under Saddam Hussein. Many Kurds lost their houses and their property. The return to their original homes is only proceeding slowly, as the central government in Baghdad has no interest in Kirkuk being integrated into an autonomous Kurdistan. At the same time, there is also the matter of oil revenues. The solution to the Kirkuk problem has thus been deferred time and again. Ala Taliban, a former member of the Iraqi parliament in Baghdad, is categorically asking for help for the expelled Kurds of Kirkuk. Specifically this city that we are, it's Kirkuk and everyone is saying it's oil city. But this is how the oil being spent. This is the, the services that we have and these are the families. I don't think that anyone in the world expects that the, the oil money has been spent for, for the, getting the life of the, uh, the, the Kirkukian people at least to get better. We, uh, for, for me and for the others, uh, this is what we, we know, this is the reality and this is the only fact that we know. The, the uh, oil money, the income from the oil, it has been always used for uh, buying weapon, for buying mass destruction weapon, and to kill us. We were tortured constantly. One day was worse than the next. I can't remember the details and I don't want to. And our only fault was that we were Kurds. I don't know why God created us as Kurds. The mayor of Kirkuk, a Kurd, holds office in a building with a double security wall. The people of Kirkuk are very disillusioned that oil never brought them any prosperity. Quite the contrary. It was why they've been persecuted and discriminated against. We've never profited from the oil wealth. Never, ever. Because of oil, our town and our country have suffered greatly, with chemical weapons being used against us. With the money from oil sales, weapons of mass destruction were manufactured and purchased. And with that money, wars were fought against us and our neighbors. Oil brought us no prosperity, only destruction and misery. Therefore, since I've been mayor, we've striven to prevent our being discriminated against any longer and to ensure that these oil revenues will benefit us in the future. Since 1991, the Kurds have been able to regain control of their region to a large extent. Having declared it a UN safe haven, Allied American and British air power protected the Kurdish zone from Saddam Hussein's attacks.
In their capital, Sulaimaniyah, they erected a statue portraying liberty breaking the chains of oppression. A widely autonomous Kurdistan has developed within the protected zone, which has oriented itself along Western role models and has triggered a modest economic boom. The Kurds, especially young people, enjoy their little freedoms visibly. They can stroll through the city without being afraid. Although a radical Islamic party also exists here, its influence is minimal. Alcohol is allowed to be sold and women can wear Western clothes without having to cover themselves. Kurdistan's still fragile freedom of the press permits the sales of Western CDs and DVDs and the publication of magazines and journals. Pictures of Jalal Talabani, the popular head of the Talabani tribe of the same name and the president in Baghdad are also on offer. It was the peace agreement between the two rival Kurdish clans, the Talabani and the Bazani, which made possible the economic boom in the region. By joining forces against Saddam Hussein, the Kurds learned that they must not fight one another. A rekindling of the old feud would dash all hopes of developing Kurdistan into a blossoming community. The biggest obstacle at the moment is the oil and gas shortage. Kurdistan receives only a limited share of Iraq's oil subsidies. Fuel has consequently been rationed. Long lines at the filling stations have become a regular occurrence. Access to petrol pumps is strictly regulated to prevent people from jumping the queue. The petrol comes from Turkey, but the quality is changing all the time. Sometimes it's good, sometimes bad. On some days there's no petrol at all distributed. And then on some days we get petrol after just two hours. Fuel is only sold in exchange for coupons. Normal citizens can purchase one tank full per week. Taxi drivers get up to two. I'm spending 25% of my salary on petrol. Anyone who isn't served before the filling station closes has to leave his car there until morning so as not to lose his place in the queue. A liter of ration petrol costs the equivalent of 82 US cents. This situation is one more reason why the Kurds are not willing to give up Kirkuk and its oil. I believe that as long as the Kirkuk problem remains unresolved, we don't have all our rights. That is to say, as long as Kirkuk doesn't belong to Kurdistan, without Kirkuk, I consider our Kurdistan to be incomplete. Much of the fuel comes from Turkey, where Iraqi oil is processed because the country lacks its own refineries. On the Turkish border with Kurdistan, long traffic jams of lorries develop in both directions. As the shortest link to the Western world, Turkey is also an important trading partner. The black market in petrol also blossoms across the green border to Iran. The precious liquid is carried in big plastic canisters on horseback to nearby cities, where it is then refilled into smaller containers by the gangs of smugglers. During this process, it's often diluted with water. Mobile black market dealers have taken over the sale of petrol along the roadside. One liter of petrol costs about one US dollar here. Smuggled fuel from Iran has a bad reputation. So far, Kurdistan has been spared the civil war-like fighting between Sunnis and Shiites. Although lately, Sunni Arabs have more frequently resorted to suicide attacks against the Kurds in Kirkuk. This is the, the Saddam Hussein turned into Milosevic. The Milosevic who became the arch Serbian nationalist who whipped up hatreds of Muslims and Serbs is Saddam Hussein who whipped these, oh, Saddam Hussein of his, and the, the men of his following who lead the insurgency today, who whip up this Sunni ideology. So they turned into, they said, 
to Sunni. Look, the Shiites are out to get you. You have their, 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 go, their power is passing to them. They use this to whip up uh, the, um, to consolidate their base amongst a smaller section of the population because they lost the population, they lost the country as a whole. blind corner on the Shat al-Arab waterway to the south of Basra is under constant surveillance by American and British patrols. Terrorists, but also illegal arms and oil smugglers operate on Iraq's sole gateway to the Persian Gulf, especially as Iran is very close. The border runs through the vast river mouth of the Euphrates and Tigris. Shiite-controlled Basra is a center of Shiite militia and violent gangs of smugglers. The military guards assess the aerial surveillance information before using speedboats to intercept and board the smugglers' boats. During these operations, they cooperate with special Iraqi units which are responsible for the control of smuggling. In large-scale oil smuggling operations, barges are often used. Their freight is transferred onto bigger boats after they leave the flat waterways. Fishing cutters are also controlled. Their owners can acquire cheaply rationed diesel oil, which they often sell for a higher price to the smugglers. This way, they can earn more money than through fishing. Any far-sighted uh, politician would understand that the real source of the future wealth, uh, oil wealth, lay in the south in untapped reserves and resources. So if anything is going to split Iraq, it's not because of the Kirkuk question. Kirkuk is a Kurdish demand and they are lobbying for it and they are fighting for it and fine. That's a political and it's a big issue for them and it's a big issue for Iraq and it will continue to be. We'll see how it plays out. But that will never split Iraq. The, the issue, the big issue is the South and what happens to the oil in the South. And by the way, the Kurds in particular have understood. It's a great, great uh, illusion, I think, that uh, I hear often in Europe uh, that, that the Kurds are the big splitters of the Iraqi in the, in the case of Iraq. It's not true. The Kurds have done more to hold together the central government in Iraq than perhaps any other force. It's the Arab house today that is in complete disarray in Iraq, not the Kurdish house. Off the highway leading to the new international airport, an imposing Khomeini mosque has been built in the south of Tehran. It's still unfinished, but already serves as an unofficial pilgrimage site. A quarter of a century after the death of Ayatollah Khomeini, the leader of the Islamic Revolution, his regime is still struggling to keep alive the goals he introduced. After proclaiming the theocracy, Khomeini regarded himself not only as a spiritual, but also as the secular head of the Islamic Republic. He established the office of a faqi, of a leader of the nation. Religious Iranians regarded this self-enhancement as hubris. Unlike the Sunni Muslims, the Shiites only accept the son-in-law of Muhammad, Ali and his sons from his marriage with Fatima, Muhammad's daughter, as the legitimate successor of the Prophet, as Imams, as well as their respective male offspring. Since the 12th Imam disappeared during his childhood around 870 and is expected to reappear as the Messiah one day, the Shiites have no Imam to guide them. This mission has now fallen to the community of Ayatollahs. This family dispute among the immediate descendants of Muhammad has since developed into a fierce religious controversy between Sunni Muslims and Shiites. A delegation of the Basijis has also gathered under the Khomeini shrine. The Basijis were originally the youth organization of the regime. As a branch of the Pazdaran, the revolutionary guards founded by Khomeini at the beginning of the Iran-Iraq war, they carried a greater burden than the armed forces of the state in the war against Iraq. 
The Basiji forces, which according to official data have a potential strength of 20 million men, are allegedly the pillars of the regime. Their leader exhorts them to champion the ideals and aims of the revolution. The Red Roses are the emblems of the martyrs who sacrifice their lives for the cause. Even more important for Iranians than the struggle for the goals of the revolution is their struggle for everyday life. Downright hardship is rare, but life is difficult. Prices are constantly rising, especially the prices of basic food, even in the bazaars. Expensive carpets are sold almost only to tourists and foreign business people. Modeled upon an upscale American style mall, the luxury complex in North Tehran appears to be part of another world. This is where the affluent Iranians live in the better climate and cleaner air at the foot of Mount Elbrus. The mall management asks for restraint during filming, as the Ayatollahs are perpetually hostile to the enterprise and have threatened to shut it down. Why this is the case soon becomes clear. Among the visitors are many young women, dressed in Western fashions, wearing their headscarves like fashion accessories. The lavish shops mainly sell Western designer brands, including such luxury items as expensive makeup, jewelry and clothing. For many young people, the mall serves merely as a meeting place. They hang out in the entrance area where there are cafes and food stands. Here, they can meet their peers, even of the opposite sex. Not exactly easy in Tehran, but not prohibited. In Iran, girls from the age of nine onwards are legally responsible and boys from the age of 15 onwards. So if a girl of 10 commits a crime, she will receive the same sentence as a 40-year-old, man or woman. For this reason, human beings under the age of 18 can be executed in Iran. A further example for a bad law is the rule on marriage among minors. A girl can be married off at the age of 13, a boy at the age of 15. I cannot imagine that a girl of 13 
is able to cope with married life. I want to underline that all these laws were introduced after the Islamic Revolution. Within the mall, the young Tehranis live as they please for a brief moment, like young Americans or Europeans, free to fashion their own lives. However, these exceptional circumstances are over as soon as they leave the Western-inspired enclave. According to Iranian law, every woman, no matter if she is a Muslim or not, Iranian or not, has to wear a headscarf. If she does not, she is punishable by flogging. In Iran, this law has been in force for approximately 27 years. But the majority of women does not approve of this law. In the streets of Tehran, many women wear their headscarf loosely so that some hair can still be seen. It is their sign of protest against the headscarf law. The streets of the city center around the university are full of young people who by now make up two-thirds of the population. Here, women also wear their headscarves in a much more daring fashion than dictated. However, the casual picture is misleading. Apart from English and French textbooks and selected works by classical authors, no Western literature is available in the university bookstores. On campus, the students appear easygoing and relatively unafraid in front of a Western microphone. There are some problems. For example, I'm as a geologist, um, you know, uh, I'm. Um, it's impossible for me to go on uh, well, you know, oil well field uh, to, for example, have oil exploration and such of these things. I, I, should, uh, I should just um, rely on the ofi official work, you know, in the office and just drawing some maps and some computer works. Um, and there are some limitations for ladies, you know, but um, we have got used to them. For most, their studies will not necessarily lead directly to a job. Considering the unemployment rate of 20%, prospects for the future are bleak. South Tehran makes a completely different impression from the north. Poor people, workers and the lower middle class live here. Everything appears poorer and more shabby. The streets, the houses, the stores and the alleys leading off the main roads. In the small cafes, only men sit and enjoy their hookahs. The hot coals for their hookahs are preheated on the street. In the south, where the unemployment rate is especially high, there is growing resentment. During the presidential elections, many people here voted for Ahmadinejad. Now they're disappointed that the price of bread is rising and that he hasn't kept his promise of including them in the country's oil wealth. country there are virtually no signs of Iran's oil wealth. Mashed Suleiman, where the first oil in the Middle East was drilled 100 years ago, has scarcely profited from the black gold flowing beneath its lands. 
Oil has been appearing in great puddles on the surface for thousands of years. But here, in the unpaved streets of the outskirts of town, the inhabitants view it as no more than stinking dirt against which they are powerless. Filled with bitterness, a retired employee of the oil company and the municipality leads us into his house, in which the oil is seeping up through the floors and the walls. Yeah. 1383, we have reported to the company again, and they didn't get action. For 20 years now, he has been asking the state-owned oil company to repair the damage. Nothing has been done. They don't want help to the people, really. The administration of the state-owned Iranian oil company resides in the only grand building in town, which lies in the center of one of the largest Iranian oil fields. Otherwise, Mashiet Suleiman looks just as undeveloped and poor as many other country towns. No one has ever done much for the poor people here. Neither the British, nor the oil companies, neither the Shah, nor the Ayatollahs. Iran is a rich country. Unfortunately, according to the latest statistics, over 10 million people live below the poverty line. Translated into numbers, this means that every seventh Iranian has to live with less than a dollar a day. This speaks for bad economic leadership and administration. Oil did not bring us luck. A parking area for trucks near the old refinery on the outskirts of Tehran. The trucks are driven until they break down. The entire traffic infrastructure of the country is outdated. A 90-year-old driver, still in the business, tells us about his working conditions. How long I've been working as a truck driver? I've been driving a truck for 70 years and 50 of them for the oil company. I was always self-employed. I was never insured, neither privately nor by the employer. How many kilometers I've driven in the last 70 years? I've definitely already orbited the Earth a few times. His colleagues discuss the question as to whether they're better off since the Mullah regime has completely taken over the oil business. All the things uh, that we have here uh, are a bit outdated, but th there have also been a, a whole lot of changes uh, over the years. So things are indeed changing f for the for the better. The nationalization brought no advantages. How do I profit? A young Iranian? How do I benefit from the oil refinery changing its name? So it's now called the National Iranian Oil Refinery. 
What he means is that after all, we're not better off, but quite the contrary, worse. But one just mustn't say that. But we're all Iranians. It affects us all. Oil feeds only a small fraction of the population. Back in 1950, only 0.7% of all employees were working in the oil industry. In 2001, the percentage was still the same. It hadn't changed. The 12 million metropolis is often enveloped in thick smog. Since there's no public transport, apart from one subway line and a few bus connections, the Tehranis depend on their cars. The country's own, predominantly old models, do not have a catalyzer and consume a lot of fuel. Given the high fuel subsidies amounting to 14 US cents per liter, Iranians themselves consume 40% of their oil production. As the country had to spend $6 billion on subsidies annually, petrol was rationed since the summer of 2007. Interesting when considering that Iran regards itself as the second largest oil producer in the OPEC. The Friday prayers on Tehran's university campus are like a political rally. In Islam, there is no separation between religion and politics. Every week on the Islamic Sunday, the leading ayatollahs propagate their fiery political slogans here. Khomeini's slogan, we will always support the Palestinians, still rings true today. Ayatollah Janati, the 84-year-old companion of Khomeini and chairman of the Council of Guardians, the religious body which supervises the government and the parliament, belongs to the arch-conservatives. However, it doesn't make much difference who is preaching at any one moment. The huge assembly hall, which bears no resemblance to a mosque, is always filled with old men who are brought here in buses. The ritual call, down with Israel, down with America, is repeated enthusiastically. The main part of the sermon consists of denouncing the West, followed by the assertion that Iran will never give up its right to uranium enrichment, and the call to Iranians to follow the moral tenets of Islam. Together with the worshippers, the Ayatollah then bows in prayer towards Mecca, whereupon everyone touches the ground several times with his forehead and knees. The former president Hashemi Rafsanjani is one of the most powerful figures among the Ayatollahs. His popularity has suffered following rumors that he is one of the most corrupt figures among the clerical leadership. His private fortune is estimated at four billion dollars. The Ayatollahs draw parts of their high income from the so-called foundations. After the Islamic Revolution, all state enterprises from the Shah's time were transformed into foundations controlled by Ayatollahs. They collect high commission fees for issuing authorizations for most economic transactions. Their closest male relatives are often high-ranking managers in both state and privately owned enterprises. A good part of the oil revenues goes to the political institutions. The income from the oil revenue has always been an important part of the state budget. The religious leaders enjoy the lion's share of the oil revenues. Today, allegedly, 40% of the income, via corruption, is pocketed by just a very small number of political leaders. The twin water towers of Kuwait are the symbol of another world. No more than a tiny spot in the desert between Iran and Saudi Arabia, the little emirate has advanced much further towards modernization than its two powerful neighbors. Kuwait owns the fourth largest oil reserves in the region. With the help of its oil riches, it has long repaired its war damage. Today, the bay along the Gulf bears more than a passing resemblance to the French Riviera.
one can see women wearing black headscarves or black abayas here too, but they wear the traditional garb voluntarily. For some time now, Kuwaiti women have had the right to vote and are permitted to drive cars. They're also not as strictly regimented in other respects. For a short time, a woman even holds a ministerial office. One of Masuma al-Mubarak's first jobs is to fight the restrictions of women's rights. On moral grounds, a new law forbids women to work between 8 o'clock in the evening and 7 o'clock in the morning. But still, to be in close bodily contact with a man as she teaches him to skate on an ice rink or even to carry on more than the briefest of conversations with him would be unthinkable for a woman in the neighboring countries. The family of the ruling sheikh, the al Sabahs, retain their ancestral rights, but they have moved towards a constitutional monarchy through the establishment of a parliament. A few years ago in Saudi Arabia, people like the Saudi businessman al Juzaya were imprisoned for demanding a constitutional monarchy. I think uh, King Abdul Azaman, uh, he is uh, really the man who has uh, love to his people. But you know, it is always, uh, you know, one cannot make all the change, you know, unless you have con complete uh, system, constitution, and uh, establishments rather than individual become good or become not good. The rapidly growing globalized economies, especially China and India, are hungry for increased energy supplies. This has made oil prices soar. Saudi Arabia's new oil wealth has made the regime safer and more self-confident. The local elections, at which at least half of the representatives are elected freely, constitute one of the first cautious steps towards reform. In Daman, Shiites are also part of it. They feel freer too. Ten years ago, I could not have this 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 uh, this uh, interview with you. Uh, ten years ago, people could be could be detained, uh, in, you know, indefinitely. Uh, ten, twelve years ago, uh, torture was there. Uh, so, uh, human, you know, uh, the the freedom of expression is not there. Uh, before, when you talk over the phone, you would be afraid. Now, it's, so so things have improved. Saudi Arabia is still a rigidly governed centralized country. Even in big cities such as Daman, the local government has very little power and the local parliament even less. This is not municipality council in this, the Western sense or in most of the world sense. It is a Saudi type of council where you get involved in cleaning you know, the streets, the garbage collection, the uh, streets themselves inside the cities uh, gardens, you know, very limited issues. You don't get involved in the, uh, uh, for example, in, in health issues or education issues in the, in the uh, area and the cities you are in. So it's not, it's not like when you get, become a mayor or a part of the municipality council where you get, everything is under your power. No, here you are only involved in the uh, municipalities, pure municipalities things, you know, as I said, you know, cleaning, uh, gardening, and streets. So it is limited. Plus, it is not uh, final until the minister looks at it. I mean, he could veto your decisions. Every year during a national holiday, the unity of the clans is celebrated in Riyadh. Individual characteristics of the country's different clans still persist today. They only agree to be unified into a single nation when compelled by force. However, the fear lives on that clan rivalries could destroy the work of unification. 
Are tribal awareness and democracy compatible? We have to introduce the culture of elections and the awareness of people whom to elect when you have right to elect. Uh, because, you know, we're still, uh, and to a certain extent, a tribal society. Uh, and uh, I am sure everybody will be attached to his own tribes. And he will uh, choose some of his cousins or the head of the tribe, even if he, if he knows no writing or, 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 or anything, because he is his relatives. So we need more time. I hope that time, that, that will not take long time. King Abdullah is considered to be reform-minded. He maintains a strong position, but he's 82 years old. In a society divided between urban affluent classes demanding even greater freedoms and the Wahhabi Puritan fanatics who want to cling to their religious dictatorship, every step towards liberalization will take a long time. It's evident that this conflict is compelling Abdullah to be very cautious. And where the other powerful princes stand, the sons of the founder of the Ibn Saud Empire, almost all of the same age, and among them Crown Prince Sultan, the country's Minister of Defense, remains a secret which is closely guarded behind the walls of the palace. Wednesday night at 9, as part of Reading Week, we delve into the world of Harry Potter and the crazed fans who've taken their love of JK's books to a whole new level in We Are Wizards.